You're listening to the Swap Society Podcast, and I'm your host, Nicole Robertson. I interview thought leaders and change makers who are working to create a more sustainable and equitable world through fashion, art, and activism. Join us for a dose of climate optimism as we envision a brighter future. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Swap Society podcast. Today, I'm talking with Masha Titova, the founder and CEO of TTOF. Welcome to the show, Masha. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. So where are you talking to us from today? And where are you from originally? I am currently in New York City in Midtown. Um, That's where everything is based right now. Originally, I am from Boston, but I've also lived in Moscow growing up and I spent a good amount of time in Los Angeles, but now I am full time in New York. Very cool. So tell us about your brand. We found each other um, through the Female Founder Collective Mm -hmm. and you have a sustainable intimates brand and I'm so excited to learn more about it. Yeah, definitely. Um, So TTOF is my company and it's my baby at this point. And I really wanted to create an intimate brand that was unique, just items that you don't really see um, from other brands. And in that process of developing, I really wanted it to be sustainable. I wanted to accomplish hitting more sizes than typical brands would. And um, a big part of me developing the brand, I really wanted it to be unique. So the more unique, the better. And Uh, With anyone that understands production, usually unique is hard because you need volume, you need to bring the price down, or there are minimums for fabric. So all of a sudden you're sitting on 500 yards and you can make a lot of thongs with 500 yards. Um, So it was a long um, process while I was still working full time of just sourcing and trying to develop. And with all of that, just previous knowledge of production and going down that path, I would find dead stock fabrics. I would find one-offs. I would find um, other brands that maybe had too much, same thing. Maybe they had to buy a minimum, but they couldn't actually produce enough to cover all of it. So they'll have excess. And I realized that not only um, purchasing dead stock and sourcing actual sustainable fabrics isn't just good, but it was also really on par with what I was trying to find um, any closeout stores. And it's really great because you end up getting 10 yards of a beautiful, gorgeous fabric and no one else has it. And you don't have to go through and create more new when there's already so much out there. So you come from the fashion industry. Tell Mm -hmm. us a little bit about how you came to work in fashion and, and your journey to creating your own brand. Yeah. So I went to school in Boston for fashion design. I always knew I wanted my own company. Um, so I would take a lot of like cross registering classes with business classes. I always kind of thought in the back of my head, maybe I'll go to business school after, but let's just do the fashion part right now and really understand production and development and all of that and just how the industry works. And after Boston, my first job was out in Los Angeles at BCBG. And I ended up working for Kanye's Easy brand for a long time. And that's really where I was able to see from a large scale corporate, how production is made and just how it runs from, I mean, BCBG is massive. They would have a store in every mall and um, just team wise, we had so many people. And then I would go to uh, consult for a startup where there's two people there and you really see how it's like locally made in small batches. So I was really fortunate to be all over the place and learn from the big guys and the little guys and uh, just 
I mean, I, in every role that I had, I would do everything from either R and D to tech packs and production to QC factories, international, domestic, a little bit of sales, understanding how warehousing works, how barcoding works, just you name it. It was something I, at some point had, um, done. And it was a really great stepping stone of learning what I really needed to do to build my own company as well. So you are sourcing a lot of your materials with kind of this, you know, dead stock or like leftovers mm-hmm. or offcasts. And, and obviously, you know, the fabric that hits the cutting room floor, so to speak, is is a pretty massive problem in terms of textile waste. Oh, yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit for people that might not be as familiar with with that? Yeah, so oh my gosh, there there's just there's so much that goes into it and it, it that that could be a whole podcast stuff in itself. Um but basically you can't use every single inch of a yard of fabric. It's just almost physically impossible. There are a couple brands that kind of specialize in that and they'll make designs out of that. But at the end of the day, you just, there's always going to be some sort of remnant, even with my stuff, everything's so tiny and I try to fit it as well as possible, but there's still going to be something, or maybe an area is defected. It got stuck on a nail in the process of moving it or something always happens. Maybe it's not usable. Um, and there are some really amazing organizations that help with that. And one local one in the New York city area is called fab scrap. So you can either donate your fabric. So say same kind of idea, you bought way too much, or maybe uh, you bought it and then you found out it just doesn't work and something happens in the wash or whatever, and you don't know what to do with it. You can donate it to them and they will resell it. Or if it's, unsellable they'll still take it and they'll sort they have a full sorting facility and they'll cut it up into shoddy and that's the stuff that like goes into couches and chairs and instead of same idea of creating more just to make it into like batting into something why not already use uh what's already out there or what would go into landfill anyways and i i don't know the exact stat but i do know that in new york if you're doing production and to a certain volume it's like a law that you have to recycle your remnants otherwise it's like considered toxic waste and i'm pretty sure in the boston area uh where i used to do production it all fabric waste was considered toxic waste because if you think about it, it's getting dyed, it's getting processed. Of course, you don't you don't want that stuff in landfills or getting into waterways and whatnot. So um Fab Scrap is a really great organization here in the New York area. And I know there are others kind of scattered throughout. So when we talked before, we talked a little bit about what was important to you when you were creating your brand? And one thing that I thought was really interesting is that everything is really sexy, but it seems like you don't use any underwires. Is that yes, true? <laughs> that is true. We have one really old style um, with a couple of sizes left that has an underwire, but moving forward there, it's only bralettes. Um, and the way Yes, everything's very sexy. Um, A lot of it is sheer, but because it's bralettes, it's really comfortable. I do a lot of wear testing and making sure the straps don't fall and making it be breathable and something you could actually wear and kind of based on my uh, experience of lugging fabric rolls in a hundred degree weather in LA and no AC. And the last thing you really want is an underwire or a padding or foam or anything like that. And I just really wanted something that fit comfortably that was almost like a sports bra ish, at least feel wise but I wanted it to still look nice. I wanted it to be, if I wanted a matching set, I could still put that on. I can go on a date later. I can still wear my normal clothes, not worrying about the racer back of my sports bra showing through. Just being able to do the things that I want to do in a comfortable way and still feel really good about myself. Um, 
And yeah, I don't, I just, it was a need that I really, really saw and I wanted it to be for a a bralette that wasn't for just college girls that was in that whole airy Victoria's Secret pink market where it's just like really, really young focused and I wanted something more mature. And like I was saying, like, I try to find the coolest fabrics that you may not really think to make lingerie out of or color combinations to really stand out and be those pieces that don't look like any other brands. You mentioned Victoria's Secret. So I have to ask, have you been watching the three? Oh, yeah, I <laughs> binged it the day it came out. <laughs> um, and I've talked to everyone and anyone that will listen <laughs> about it. Um, if anyone hasn't watched it, please go watch it. It's it is wild. It's on just between the business, the people involved. I mean, I knew some of it, just I listened to one of the podcasts and a couple other just articles that have always come out. But this was, yeah, fascinating for sure. What was the most interesting takeaway for you after seeing that? Um, Probably there was one statement towards the end. And I know the whole, a lot of it, they talk about the Epstein and all of that stuff. And someone kind of made this like statement of if you were like, like when I was in high school, if I was in a mall and I spent money, my money probably somehow ended up with Epstein. And that is just such a hard thing to like wrap your head around and just how intertwined and crazy and kind of if you step back and you really do look at all those conglomerates and I mean now too like the more you kind of you get older and wiser and you realize wait I like everything is owned by 10 people and it's just really really uh on just a global scale fascinating and disturbing (laughs) and um I don't know it was just a lot of craziness that I really just like as a side note I'm like obsessed with watching like cult documentaries and I really am interested in psychology and I realize that's why I'm like really into marketing because it's just like what makes people do things that they do that don't make any sense from maybe an outside perspective and that could be waiting in line for 13 hours to get into a Supreme store drop thing, or it could be joining a cult and like what happens in our brains. And I feel like that documentary really, you're like, there are moments that you're just like, what happened? How how did this happen? Um, So it's just, it's, it's disturbing, but it also just kind of like a train wreck. You can't look away. One thing that really struck me as well that I thought was really interesting to watch was the evolution of their marketing. Oh, and so fascinating. Yeah. From like their uh, kind of preppy, very um, high class lady. lady. (laughs) Yeah. Just like, oh, drinking tea. And she's just so like fancy. And then it goes into bombshell with the wings and the angels. Fascinating. Like, I, it's, yeah. It's really, really interesting. They also talk a lot about how they really were marketing to men, right? They were men, men Mm -hmm. creating a brand for men and women were just kind of the vehicle, right? It's like Mm -hmm. (laughs) the vehicle to like entertain the men and make the men rich. Yep. And at every level. (laughs) And and I find that really fascinating, too. And I think that obviously I spend a lot of time thinking about the fashion industry and how it works and what's not working, you know, for Mm -hmm. the people that make the clothes, the people that wear the clothes, the the, the planet and all of these things. Um, And I think that that docuseries just really put it out there. It's like this is 100 percent just about making money and yeah Mm -hmm. you know where do you want to spend your money 
right? Yeah. Are you going to give your money to these massive corporations mm -hmm. that are manipulating you and, you know, doing whatever they can do to make money with zero regard for, mm -hmm. you know, people or planet? Or do you want to support smaller brands? maybe even female owned brands, mm -hmm. um, you know, people that really care about, you know, other women because they were never empowering women, right? They were just using women, but using this message of women empowerment, it's, mm -hmm. I thought they did a really good job of just telling, telling this that whole story. story. Yeah. I, I totally agree. And a, a different one, just if you haven't watched it, I would watch the Abercrombie one too. Mm. It's a similar, but kind of different in its own way. But yeah, it's, it's fascinating. It, it really, really is. It's just to make money at all costs. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a great quote from Michael Gross and the author of the book model that mm -hmm. I, you know, it's something to the effect of, you know, fashion is amoral and, you know, mm -hmm. it lives by one rule, sell the frock at any cost. <laughs> That's yep. a paraphrase, but, yep. <laughs> and yeah. And so if we, if we want to change, I mean, obviously, you know, some people are creating companies or brands that are better alternatives, but we also really need consumers to make changes. How are you, how are you marketing your brand? How do you find your customers right now? <laughs> what the interesting part is that um, I was just talking about this with friends over the weekend and my, we were talking about advertising and just what I'm doing in this next two weeks. Um, and he, her boyfriend was like, yeah, but like, you're not going to be marketing to me. Like you need to be marketing to like whatever women of whatever um, age category. And I was like, no, I am going to be marketing to you. And he was like, what? And my, uh, my friend, we actually did our MBA together. So one of our group projects for marketing, we were able to, um, the school allowed them to do it on my company. So she knows a lot of random stats and stuff behind TTOF. And she was like, literally like she's like isn't it like 40 percent of your customers are male and I was like yeah it's insane so even coming back to that same conversation of like oh it's for the male gaze and whatnot I don't even do any of the verbiage towards buy this for your xyz I just do I mean, all the pleasant things like enjoy your life. Um, these are comfy. They come in all the sizes, just like facts and then more inspirational, just that marketing typicalness. Um, but it is, it hovers between 30 to 40% um, are male, which I just think is so, so fascinating. And so many people still buy for gifting and all of that. Um, so it's always um, interesting. And if I make it more geared towards men, it doesn't sell as well towards men. Like, I don't know why or what the logic behind it is. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's, it's really interesting because I tried to, um, I, just the whole branding behind it and what I see as the TTOF customer, I live by the rules of like, life is short and you should just appreciate life and celebrate little wins and just really enjoy every day, which is why if you put on fancy lingerie, you should be able to do that every day. You don't have to wait for a fancy occasion to like buy that nice bottle of champagne and you shouldn't have to wait for uh, some sort of occasion to wear the nice lingerie. It should just be enjoying your life every day. Like every day is a celebration. So all of my verbiage and copy and imagery is really behind that. And just, just let your life be, let it be chaotic, let it be exciting and entertaining and fun and just, just enjoy. Um, so that's a big part of the messaging and imagery and all of that. Um, but yeah, the, the male customer, it's amazing actually. <laughs> that's so interesting, but I guess, you know, my husband has bought me 
intimates before, you Mm -hmm. know, lingerie before. So I suppose it just depends on, you know, the the couple or the relationship or the dynamic. Definitely. (laughs) Um, it, and you know, you were talking about where the lingerie, like where the sexy lingerie, I interviewed, mm-hmm. um, a stylist, Stephanie Jasandi little recently, and she actually specifically talked about how wearing a really nice bra, no one else is going to see it most mm-hmm. likely, but it doesn't matter. I think her words were, it can give you a lift. You know, she meant mm-hmm. an emotional lift. It can also give you a- <laughs> like an actual lift. Too. <laughs> an <Yeah>. actual lift. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, one of, I saw recently an interview with um, Dita Von Tees and someone had uh, like asked her, how do you wear these like extravagant lingerie, like costumes, attires every day? How do, how do you do it? How do you feel comfortable wearing it and one of the other questions was like not only just like you personally like feel comfortable but then how do you feel comfortable just like seeing a new person and being like yeah I'm in this like entire decked out set and how do you not feel like you're being too extra or anything like that and her response was so simple she was like I wear it every day I don't even think about it so like if I am seeing someone new to me, this is like, there's no, I, it's just so, it's like drinking water. Like for her, she just feels so insanely comfortable in it because she wears it every day and no one sees it when she's fully dressed. Like, no, it's the same. Yeah. Like wear the bright red bra under your college hoodie. It's, it's just because that's just going to make you stand up taller and make you put a smile on your face in the morning and whatnot. And I just really love that quote from her that she was just like, if you you do it every day, you don't think twice about it. And then you feel really confident, comfortable and all of that. Um, And you don't feel like you're not in your skin. And I really, really love that. You mentioned earlier sizing. And so Mm -hmm. I definitely want to touch on that. You said that, you know, you do all bralettes, but you don't just do small, medium, large, extra large. Mm -hmm. What, what are your sizes? How far do you go? So the largest size band wise is a 40 CD. A lot of the, because it is bralette, a lot of the cups are uh, stretchy. And with the amount of fitting, we kind of realize that, we can combine two of the cups. It usually works pretty well. Um, so our largest band size with cup size is a 40 CD, but then we have a 36 FG. So that's like the biggest, I, I guess you would say like cup size, even though they're sister sizing and all that craziness, but it goes from a 30 band to a 40 band. And we'll go from like an a double a cup to a h cup so that's an all in between and all of that (laughs) it is about 30 oh just over 33 sizes a couple styles might have one or two less or more so it's around there i loved seeing that you had a bralette in my size because (laughs) And, and, you know, they changed, they've changed, they've changed Mm -hmm. a lot. I was a professional dancer and I was completely flat chested and then I got older and then I had kids and like, now I have this like crazy bra size. And (laughs) I really fortunately went somewhere where they sized me because I remember I was really struggling to find something that fit. Mm -hmm. And I went to somebody that kind of like resized me because I wasn't Mm -hmm. the same size that I used to be everything was so different and I guess I made a guess but it was totally wrong and when they told me my size I was just kind of blown away where I thought no there's no way that no way <laughs> that doesn't make any sense to me like absolutely not do you have any recommendations for people maybe they're shopping online and they're not even sure mm-hmm. what their bra size is is there a reliable way for people to figure out their bra size on their own at home? Or or is it really best to go to a professional and have somebody kind of measure you up? 
So I guess it's like twofold. It's depending on your comfort level. Like I know some people are just not okay with someone coming up and like going under their boobs and putting like a tape measure around and touching them. So maybe if that's you, then you should totally just do it on your own. Uh, You just need um, either a string and a ruler or you need a tape measure. So kind of whatever you have available, you can Google videos. They're excellent ways of doing it the best way if you have um i would say a larger trust that has like gravity to them there's a chair method where you lay down on a chair so you're parallel to the floor so then you get a more accurate um measurement so if you google on youtube like bra measuring chair method that's the way to go. Usually you might still want to have like your significant other or friend or someone just because it's too, (laughs) there are too many things happening. Um, We also do free virtual fittings to just help you out, go through. I, my party trick is now being really good at guessing bra sizes. Um, So I've just, it's just become a thing. (laughs) Um, It's like disturbing how accurate I am. (laughs) Um, So even like a virtual fitting, if you're just like, okay, I'm doing these number things, whatever. And then we can kind of go through what's the size you are wearing. And I can, I usually have a couple of questions where is it too tight? Is it too loose? And then off of those, I can figure out what way to go. Um, or definitely, definitely it's, and I would recommend if you were to go in person, find that random little boutique that's been around forever. And the woman is like, she's had it for 40 years, kind of a thing. And she knows exactly what she's doing and what is happening. Like, um, especially if it's like a multi-brand boutique, not like a branded boutique, because they will tell you straight and measure you. And like, they'll have, because it's a multi-brand, they'll have different brands that you can kind of try on all at once and kind of get the fit. And then right on the spot, you can get put into the perfect bra. I would avoid going to like a Victoria's Secret or even an Airy or any of those big box places, just because if you think about it, who's working at Victoria's Secret, when I was in high school, it was all high school kids. And I'm, let's just go with experience alone. (laughs) And they may, and then they'll do it like over your shirt and all that stuff. And it's not the way that you need to do it. Um, but yeah, so just depending, but yeah, find, find that random little spot in your town that they're just like, the crazy ladies that you just want to be best friends with uh, that have been doing this for their whole lives. Like you need to find them Uh, or like we do online fittings and then go uh, like literally YouTube can be your best friend with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now I'm really tempted. I feel like I should make you try to guess what my size. (laughs) (laughs) I've been like, it's been like calculating in my head. I know it's like, I'll have to like stand up. So this is, I don't know. Do you want like a side view? Um, Well done. Can I ask you your, what size like t-shirt you would wear, like a medium or a large typically? Um, so this is a medium t-shirt. I'm a size small, but I often have to get a bigger shirt. If that makes sense. I know. And everybody who's watching this video, it's like, here they are. (laughs) So I would say (laughs) for band, I would say the other thing too, is like a lot of people, even if they're this size, they may not like a band as tight or like they prefer it tighter or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I would just from like my my point of view, I would say your band is a 34, but then you would be going into and that would be snug. And then if you didn't want it snug, maybe you'd be a 36, but I would peg you as a 34. And let's go with like maybe a G, so like a triple D. Interesting. Two, three. Yeah. You're or close. like a or like a E, maybe. Yeah. Like a double D. <clears throat> so I'm a 32 double D or E. Oh. You were very That's close. So yeah, close. you were super close. Yeah. So close. And so I find that even though I'm like, I'm like a size four right now and clothes, but like oh, I, okay. 
Oh, I should have asked you that because then I would have said 32. Yeah, but like I got a medium in this t-shirt because I just mm-hmm. wanted to make sure that More it didn't room. feel like it was like super, super tight. Mm-hmm. I had also looked at um, like the measurements and stuff and just saw where it was like, you know, just trying to figure it out. But um, but yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's something too where it's like, wait, I don't even understand. Like, because I, I feel like how you know in my mind i'm like how could i be a double d like it's hard for me to like fathom because i think in my mind that sounds so big right because (laughs) like pop it's like i found some article that like actually explained it and it's very pop culture references and movies and shows and whatnot that like they wouldn't say band size. They'd just be like, she's a D cup. And then it would be like, whatever. And that would, the association to like a D cup means it's really big. And that's just like this weird. And I, it's like very US thing too. Like it's uh, American movies. It's like from here, because if you go to other countries that just that pop culture never happened. So like people don't really associate that in the same way. Um, but it's the same thing for me. Like my whole life I've been like a 34 C and then just depending if I like lose a little weight or gain a little weight. Um, I definitely have bras that are 32 D's and I consider myself like I'm on the low, low, like I, like, I mean, in comparison, like I'm in a t-shirt, like it does not look like I have D cups, but because of the way that like the sister sizing and it's a cup to band ratio, it's so confusing. It took me like us being (laughs) women that wear bras for all of our lives. It took me like six months to properly without needing like a paper in front of me to figure out like off the top of my head, start to understand the sizing. It was crazy. It seems really, it does seem really crazy. And, you know, we, we do swap bras at Swap Society. So we do get some bras. And something that I've noticed is that in my mind, we, not coming from an intimate background and just knowing my own sizing, right? Which is, I think, what most people are. Uh, you know, I I was under the impression that cup size was static. And what I've noticed that's not, is that yeah. that's actually not true. So like a 32 double D and a 40 double D are not anywhere near the same nope. size. Nope. Nope. Yeah. Cause just like even thinking about it, it's like, yeah, if you're a 30 double D you're, I, th- I think it's like a 38 a like it like cup volume size, like those are equivalent to each other. So it's just like, it's just, it, it it's a lot. (laughs) It's a lot, (laughs) which is also part of the reason why I do kind of like combined cup sizes because it's just inventory and production. So even going back to sustainability, it's like, I actively can't be producing every single, um, bra size out there because it's, it's just, there's so many, like you could do so many variations. Um, any big, big brand that like they have their basics and they have like an absurd amount of sizes. I think they're in the 90. Like, can you imagine holding inventory for 90 different sizes of one style and one color? Like that's just, it's insane. Like where I'll do a production run of 20 pieces. (laughs) Like, well, I won't even make all the sizes if they don't get bought. You have worked for fashion companies. You come from the fashion industry. What are some things about the fashion industry that, you know, you feel more people should know about? You know, what are what are some of those deep, dark fashion industry secrets? Um, gosh, uh, where do I even begin? Um, I since we're talking a lot about sustainability, I think, um, especially being on the back side of things and being within this industry, having so many friends also in this industry, working at other companies, you hear stories, you hear about how their corporate life is, how their retailers are. Um, and it's just, 
it's the, my conclusion is that it is so unbelievably hard to be sustainable. And I know a lot of brands will kind of latch on to like, that's what makes us different. We're sustainable. But if you really just pay attention, if you're, if you have friends that tell you about stuff, if you work there, you see that it's still not enough and it's still really, really surface area. And unfortunately, I feel like a lot of times it's very, um, just marketing lingo instead of actual actionable items. A great example of this is um, I think like Madewell is doing great and they're trying to really be sustainable. And I went to a lecture where they were talking about sustainability in retail a couple of weeks ago. And one of the biggest um, wastes and just it just blows your mind um, when you see it at the volume just throughout my years and talking to everyone else and having my brand now and talking with friends with their brands. The biggest issue is poly bags, which you would never really think about when you're talking about like fashion, glamorous, all that stuff. But if you're a brand and you need to ship stuff out to either customers or to department stores, everything has to be packaged in poly bags. So if you are working with a large uh, conglomerate of a wholesale brand, um, kind of like a, any, anything like a Macy's, it, it doesn't matter. Um, they require you to ship things in a very specific manner. If you do not, even one little thing, they will charge you for the inconvenience of having to relabel or repackage or whatever. So you want to avoid any additional cost because you're already making pennies because it's wholesale. And um, what happens is you are packaging every single garment in an individual poly bag, then every poly bag gets labeled. And if you're wondering like, well, why, why can't there be a better solution? Then you think about it, you walk into a warehouse. If anyone's been in a warehouse, even if you're talking like a Costco, you want to wash your hands after you get out of those places. They're dusty. There's a lot going on. There's boxes coming from like from rainy days and snowy days and dirty trucks and all of that stuff. If your stuff is not on a poly bag, your stuff is going to be dirty and then they can't sell it. Like it's just, it's a way to protect each item. And if you're thinking about a, a warehouse guy in the back that needs to scan something, how are they, he's not going to be pulling out the hang tags of every garment when he needs to pull like 10 of something to ship it to um, some wholesale account. And when you start looking at brands that do the volume that they do, you're talking thousands of poly bags. And what happens is you package them all up at the manufacturer, you ship it to a warehouse, then the warehouse ships it to whatever warehouse of the sacks and everyone else. And then either it goes straight to the consumer, which also you might want it in a poly bag because things happen in transit. You don't want it to get damaged. Uh, or the wholesaler rips them all open so that they could hang it on the floor. So they just, it's all of these poly bags that go to waste. And one thing that was brought up by um, Madewell was that it is going to take them until 20, I don't quote me on this, but it was something like 2025 or 2027. And they've been working on it for years to try to figure out how to make a sustainable poly bag. And this is coming from made well with J crew and they have how much money and how many resources and they're ta it's taking them how long to figure out this poly bag situation. So when you look at like smaller brands, I mean, where, what, there's only so much you can do. And it's that same, um, greenwashing where you see someone's like biodegradable poly bag. They're not you throw it into your backyard and you bury it, it's not going to biodegrade. Usually if it is biodegradable or anything like that, that means it needs to go through a very special processing system. And if 
that those machines um there's one brand in europe uh, i was also watching their whole path on sustainability and they found out that the poly bag that everyone uses that's like biodegradable in all of europe there's like one facility that will actually be able to process it and be able to biodegrade it as they say and if I mean, I don't know how it is where you are, but I know every place I've ever lived, like plastic bags aren't recyclable. Like that's part of like, you can't put that in the recycling. So you really do throw all of that out. And I think that's huge that like hangers, even hang tags, all of those like little materials. It is just wild how much of that is, um, going through the fashion industry and it's something that I me and friends every time we find out something new we just like spam each other and like tell each other about the new um just packaging solutions that we're able to find and I think that's like a really really big one so just with that there's a lot of greenwashing from like manufacturing sides and another thing is like I mean you can think of like the most sustainable brands out there. And I've been told stories of how employ like friends of friends would be like, yeah, we don't even recycle in the office. Like we throw everything out. We, it's just like, they're like the amount of samples we'll throw out, just like even paper, like even cans and it will be massive, um, like hundred plus employees. So just think about just the trash from humans every day of in an office building and they don't even recycle just like the basic stuff. Yet this brand is tooting their own horn about how great and how sustainable they are. And unfortunately, the other issue is that uh, like there are some brands that started off with um, dead stock, just how I am doing with materials available and then they grow. And then all of a sudden, uh, like RIP Barney's will want a hundred units of something or they want to reorder something. And they're like, oh, we, we can't because this fabric doesn't exist. We don't even know where it came from. Um, and if you want to grow, growing means volume and growing means you're no longer doing sustainable things as much as you are. So it's a, it's a really challenging balance of trying to be sustainable towards the environment while also be sustainable in terms of profit and making sure you're paying employees and you're like able to continue and have your doors open another day. And I think that's like a really, really challenging and difficult um, balance that a lot of fashion companies that are going into sustainability are battling right now. I know that Patagonia did, I read an article about it. I know that they did a study about not shipping things with poly bags and they did a, a huge test and they found that clothing was getting damaged too much. And then yeah. when you weigh the cost and, and, you know, mm -hmm. versus the benefit, you know, and all of these things where it's all like, the well, things. Yeah. if, if more clothes get damaged, then it's not more sustainable no, to not do the poly waste. bag. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then just to touch on the biodegradable thing, it, it is really interesting, you know, yeah, at home composting cannot deal with bioplastics. Mm -mm. You, you need industrial compost facilities in the United States. We have basically zero None. I, composting yeah. infrastructure here. They have more in Europe um, and in some countries in Europe in particular, you know, they have a whole method for that and they're trying to be better about that. But yeah, you can't, you know, or even those mailers, there are some companies out there that are like, I'm a compostable bag or whatever it says on the outside. And it's like, well, that's nice. Who's like, who's going uh, to compost who's gonna that? Who's going to do it? <laughs> yeah. And another thing too is like people will be like, oh, it's a poly mailer. That's not sustainable. Let's use a um, like cardboard box instead because that's, you can like recycle those and whatnot. And um, I was at a, like a lingerie fabrics trade show and one of the seminars there was also about sustainability and the person talking about, I think they were a logistics company. So they were talking all about how offsetting CO2 and there's like all the different avenues that you can try to be more sustainable. And they had done like a year long um, test about specifically 
not recycling the item, but about CO2 emission and just like all of that. And they were like, we calculated that actually if you can, like if your stuff is small enough and it can fit into a poly mailer and you're doing the volume of what, like some crazy volume, um, it is actually more sustainable to put it in the poly mailer because you have less trucks going out and like you're using up less space on air flights or trains or whatever than on a, if you had to put it in a box that takes up 5x the time like the amount of space so i mean it's just it's so much more than just like oh this one thing isn't sustainable because that's not how life works and that's not how an entire industry works so no matter how sustainable you try to make it it's, it's baby steps and making it a little bit more and a little bit more and where you figure it out, you make it more sustainable, but it's really, I, I always uh, like uh, the sustainability um, page on my website, the first line, I'm pretty sure it's like, sustainability is really hard. <laughs> and then I just go into like, this is all the, th these are all the things that we are doing to be sustainable. And every time we learn something new, we are just going to move forward in a more sustainable way um because it's really hard and unfortunately bigger bigger has as we were talking about earlier the companies that are just there to make the money um like the sheans of the world um they're not making it any easier because their pricing is really low and it's competitive and people are like why we don't get it why is this price like this and their bras are priced at two dollars like and it it makes it really really difficult um and they're not sustainable that's just like there's nothing sustainable about anything happening with those types of companies um but yeah, I would just, I would, as a consumer, be like, cool, they're doing things to be sustainable, but to take everything with like a grain of salt and know that there's probably a lot, a lot, a lot more that everyone can do. And there's probably a lot of greenwashing, right? Because oh, so much. If you're so a fast much. fashion brand or, you know, a fashion conglomerate and you're talking about sustainability, the chances are that you probably aren't doing enough. <laughs> No, it's kind of, I, I was listening to a podcast about, um, like the H and M con conscious capsule, whatever it's called. And one of the podcast hosts was like, if they can make that, why don't they just make, why isn't everything just that? Like, why, why are you making this separate thing that is sustainable, but honestly, your whole company should just be doing what you're doing with this capsule. Like you, you have proved to yourself that you are able to do these things. Why is it that you can't somehow make everything like that? And I was like, that is a just like listening to it. I was like, yes, like that's such a great point. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Uh, a lot of those big brands really need to do better. Absolutely. But then it's the same conversation, right? Like, okay, great. We're going to up prices or we're going to counter source something. But if they are a publicly traded company, if they have um, shareholders, all of a sudden it's a little like, oh, unfortunately, what's the first thing companies do when they lose revenue? They fire people. So then you're talking about like, that's not sustainable because then you're putting a lot of people out of a job just so your stuff is more sustainable. Like it's that delicate, delicate balance of um, trying to just be fully aware of what you're doing and what your actions lead to, whether that's environmentally or with your people. Yeah, absolutely. So to kind of, you know, Shift gears a little bit. I always love a, a, a good fashion love story. Uh, what's your favorite piece in your closet and why? So, unfortunately, it is a fast fashion <laughs> item, but I got it. I mean, I was like probably a freshman in college and I've had it for, I was trying to do, I wore it this week and I was trying to do the math and I think I've had it for 10 years. So, this was like, back when they were still making things 
that didn't fall apart in two wears. And it is a blue lace dress and it's stretchy and it's like a long sleeved and it's very like it's like an electric bright blue it's just like if I need a good luck it's like my good luck dress and every time like I have a couple of friend groups that just like know that that is like the good luck dress and if I wear it I'm just like guess what (laughs) and I'll like send a picture and it's just like everyone's response is like oh my gosh we can't believe you still have this dress because it's been so long and it is it is as if it's like brand new it is such good quality it's like old top shop like that I got in London just like forever forever ago and it's just it's slightly too short it's fine. I will never give it up. (laughs) I'm just like, I'm at the, I'm like, I know that it may not be quite appropriate anymore, but like, I don't care (laughs) because every time it's like, I just know if I leave my house in that dress, I will get complimented. I'll have the best day. And it just, it's, I don't know. Love it. What's inspiring you right now? Ooh, that's a great question. It's inspiring me. I've been dabbling back into um, beadwork. So I've been like going down crazy black holes of like vintage beading and like gowns and everything. And I'm, my um, in college, I did a whole beadwork thing and I happened to like stumble upon the box of it's like crystals and beads and just like beautiful beautiful I mean just like the whole box sparkles and I was like oh I forgot I had these I should like do something with them so um I'm getting really inspired by just this beautiful box so I really the idea is I'm going to make a couple of made to order one off uh, beaded bras and something that you could wear out and maybe throw a blazer on. So it's not sheer, like, and make it really almost like couture esque. Um, and so I've just been like going through old magazines and anytime I'm like walking around and I see someone in a beaded something, I like take note and like that that's been like, my right now it, every time I like see it um the brain starts kind of moving and trying to figure out if I want to do like um I really want to do a branded sweatshirt at some point and I'm I keep thinking like how awesome would it be if it's like Swarovski crystals instead of just like an embroidery or something just something a little bit more glitz and glam and fabulous awesome and what's keeping you feeling optimistic these days? It's a crazy, crazy time. (laughs) Um, I would definitely say just like friends, family, support group uh, of like just all the people that are around me. Um, I, there's so much happening in the world and it's kind of that same, it's, like, I know I've always been a very like stressed and anxious human, just like my whole life. And so it's been a daily like process of forcing myself not to let things get to you, to do things about it, but not let it like overcome your day to day where you can't actually get what you need to do. Um, so I feel like a lot of what i push onto the brand how I was saying earlier like celebrate every day and celebrate the little wins a lot of that actually wasn't even part of the beginning branding it's something that's I've started to incorporate as I have just like mentally with like co- like especially starting with COVID and then just like with every other week something else happening um it was something that I would have to remind myself because you, whether you're a parent or working or you have your company or whatever is happening in your life, you are head down, go, 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 go. And a lot of good things happen. But a lot of times those bad kind of overshadow the good. And that's why I've always tried to like, no, today, what was the good thing that happened? Great. Yes bad things happen, but to always just like, just try to see the good and see the light in everything. One thing, um, I started doing this year is every day you write down a good thing 
and then you put it into like a little jar or something. And on New Year's, you open it up and then you remember all the little things and you remember instead of like, oh, what was my year like? It's like you have like, and it could be like the sushi today was awesome. Like, it, it, like if I, if nothing really like happened, I'll still try to find like some random thing. Um, because I like, I just poked at it this week and I pulled one randomly and I was like, I forgot this ha-. like just completely just all the little things you forget because so much craziness does happen. And I feel like that's like going to be a really fun one for the end of the year as kind of like a year tradition of just, always trying to find the good and remember the good, um, to be in that good mindset. I love that. And that's such a fun idea to write a little something down mm-hmm. and, you know, look back at it at yeah. the end of the year. Cause you're hung over on the first anyways, you don't really <laughs> want to do anything. You're, you're kind of miserable and you're like, Oh, this year. And like, did I really do anything last year where this is like, you can like really see like, Oh wow. Like a lot happens in a year. And I'm, I'm really excited to kind of to see the whole thing. That's so great. Well, thank you so much for chatting with us. How can people find you and your brand? Yes. So my personal Instagram is the Masha Titova, just all one word. And then for the brand, it's Titov label. So T I T O V and then label. And that is for everything across the board. It's titovlabel.com, TikTok, Pinterest is real cute right now. Um, so you should check that out. Instagram, I mean, name a social platform and we are on it under TTOF label. Excellent. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. I hope you have a beautiful rest of your day. Yeah, you too. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the Swap Society podcast. Swap Society is an online clothing swap for women and kids that makes it easy and affordable to mix up your wardrobe sustainably. We're a growing community of women across the USA who are creating positive change by swapping our clothes and slowing down our fashion consumption. We would love to swap with you. If you're interested in joining, you can sign up at our website. Learn more at www.swapsociety.co. That's swapsociety.co. You can find the show notes for each episode on our website. Please get in touch with us on social media too. We're on Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and YouTube for the video version of this podcast at Swap Society. Music is by Joel Korlitz and yours truly. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Please help us spread the word by subscribing, leaving a rating and review, sharing on social media, or simply telling a friend. We really appreciate your support. Have a wonderful day, and remember to swap before you shop.